So today's lecture follows on pretty directly from last week's lecture on the dynamic web. So today we're going to look at uh, content management systems, CMSs, and um, specifically at the WordPress CMS. And then we'll have a little bit of an overview of uh, WordPress theme development, which we'll then look at in more detail in the tutorials. So just a little bit of a recap on the important points from last week. Uh, we looked at the, the trends in the evolution of web design and web development. And so some of the things that, that we came up with were that we had more content, which was more frequently, uh, more frequently updated and more frequently uh, on demand, and from lots more sources, so multiple contributors to website, including uh, the users as a, as a contributor to the content of the websites as well. Um, so, and then within a, a development or a design content creation team, a lot more uh, varied roles. Uh, so as opposed to having maybe one person in charge of everything in a website from the design, the development and the content updating, these roles are distributed amongst uh, usually multiple people depending on the, the scale of the website. And so as a web designer, uh, you at least need to have some sort of understanding uh, across uh, more, more roles or more specialized areas than you, you may have had to in the past. Uh, we looked at the dynamic website model where website content is stored in a database and or other external sources and assembled with markup and output by a web server script application. Uh, specifically, we looked at the PHP scripting language, which sort of forms this part of the model here, which provides us with our, our conditional logic and automation and all of the, the nice things that hopefully were demonstrated in the tutorials last week. So we saw that some of the advantages of dynamic websites are that content can be updated in a decentralized way, meaning that a single webmaster does not have the sole privilege or responsibility of updating the website. We can modularize our code. So again, we saw that in the tutorials where, whereby rather than if we have a series of pages, rather than having to maintain each section and duplicate it across a bunch of pages, we can, we can split those common bits of code off and, and maintain them as one single unit of code. And then using uh, PHP, we can combine them back in uh, to, the, to the, the ultimate end output. And then we've also got our automation of tasks, which we'll talk to more later. OK, so, um, so at, the, at this point, we, we had sort of hopefully agreed that uh, in the current environment of, of web design of websites uh, that really uh, dynamic websites are the the solution that's uh, either preferred or in some cases just absolutely required in order to solve some some web web application design problems so what is a content management system and specifically a web content management system okay so I'll, I'll use these terms interchangeably and you'll you'll generally see them used interchangeably, but, but we should at some point say we're very specifically talking about web content management systems because we can have content management systems that don't manage web-based content. Um, but from here on in, I'm just going to re refer to them as, as content management systems or CMSs. Uh, so we've got a, a definition here. A, a content management system is a tool that enables a variety of centralized technical and decentralized non-technical staff to create, edit, manage, and finally publish in a number of formats a variety of content, such as text, graphics, video, documents, etc whilst being constrained by a centralized set of rules, process, and workflows that ensure coherent, validated electronic content. So that's really just a flowery way of saying it's a bunch of interfaces that allow us to do exactly what it says, manage content. Okay, so there are uh, some disadvantages of using a CMS and a lot of these overlap with the disadvantages that we acknowledge that just using dynamic dynamic web technologies have but they can be more complicated to set up uh, the level of technical knowledge required for the developer and the designer is increased so as a designer 
you need to have some understanding uh, of what, what the constraints of the underlying CMS that you might be designing for might place upon the, the, the limits of the design that you can implement. And usually that's fairly flexible, but, but that is something that, that will factor into how, how much development then is required to go into implementing your design. So that's one of the big reasons that we're, we're even though your actual implementation of WordPress as an assignment doesn't come until the second half of the semester, why we want to familiarize you with the technology early on so that uh, that in some way can inform um, how much extra effort a, a certain design may may take implementing with a with a, as as a WordPress theme, for example, as as opposed to if you were to just implement that theme as a static static based website or that design. Um, okay, and I say here these these can and will be different for every CMS and are often difficult to determine definitively. Um, so again, a useful reason to, to play around with it and try it first. So it's always good to fail early and fail often and then figure out you know, what is possible so that when you, when you come to creating the final thing that you have um, you know, some hindsight to draw upon. So CMSs, because they're sort of prepackaged not for any specific individual design problem or website, uh, in, in some way they're generic and they're designed to, to, to uh, suit a, a wide range of design problems. So in some way they're, they're an out-of-the-box solution and, and, um, and if, if your design goals align very closely with, with uh, what the, the intention is for that CMS, uh, then it's probably going to be a fairly smooth process. But there may be cases where you have a, a fringe case where you have a design which may not necessarily um, adhere to the, the design of the development philosophies of a CMS. And in that, in that case, um, you may have to wrestle with it a little bit in order to get it to do the things that you want. Um, Okay, so many CMSs are extendable or customizable, but even these processes follow certain models and conventions. So that again is just sort of extra knowledge that you need to know. And so you may find at some time, at some point, uh, that you'll be working on a project where it's, it's specialized enough that it may actually make more sense to create your own content management system than use one that already exists. I'd be very surprised if, if that's the case for anyone's, anyone's assignment. Um, but but that's not to say that it, it doesn't ever happen uh, in 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 the realm of possible projects. Um, okay, but that's not something that we necessarily need to worry about. Uh, upgrading to new versions of a uh, CMS may break things. Um, this is fortunately something which uh, a lot of CMS developers have taken on board as a problem in the past and it's not so much an issue anymore. WordPress happens to actually be very, very good at maintaining backwards compatibility. Um, uh, but that, that can be an issue depending on the CMS that you, that you use. Um, migrating content to a different CMS may be difficult or infeasible. Um, so you may decide that a, a particular CMS is, is good to use today, um, but depending on the lifetime of a website. It may only need to be around for six months or a year, but it may need to be around for 10 years. And you know, in, 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 this, in this area where things change so rapidly, who's to say that that will still be the best solution in 10 years time, or if it will even exist still in 10 years time? So that's, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, and, and often you just have to make a, you know, a, a best educated guess. And and at the same time, if, you, if at some point you decide that a, another CMS is a better solution, uh, often it's not in the, in the interests of the original CMS that you're using to make it easy for you to take your content out and put it somewhere else. Um, fortunately, there are CMSs, again, which do you know, realize that, that, that people may want to do that. And WordPress, again, is one which will allow you to quite, quite easily export your content in a format that a lot of other CMSs will then re-import. So it's not like you have to go and manually enter all of the content uh, again if you do end up uh, deciding to change CMSs later on. A 
Okay, so uh, as we have mentioned, there are some cases when when uh, you shouldn't use a CMS. Um, there are, you know, sort of CMS evangelists who will attempt to tell you that the CMS is the solution for everything. Um, but really, if 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 you've got a website where you have content that's that doesn't doesn't change very much very often, um, then the overhead of setting up a CMS might just be overkill, uh, might be unnecessary. So you, you really only want to use a solution that takes more setup time if that setup time is going to be recouped later on in maintaining and managing the website. Um, and so that's usually going to be the case. There's not many websites that you're going to create these days where you just create it and sit it and it leaves there and it never changes. Um, but, but it is a possibility, and in, in that case, it, it may not be worth the extra effort of, of using a CMS. Um, and as I kind of mentioned before, if the design and or architecture of your website is highly unique, not something that's really a, a case that that CMS may have been designed with that, with that particular use in mind, then you may find it more difficult to attempt to get your unique design a way of doing things to work in the, in, in the existing framework of a CMS. But again, these, these are both pretty, pretty fringe cases which for our purposes we, we don't need to worry about. Okay, so the, um, some of the ad hopefully obvious advantages of using a CMS makes managing lots of content, constantly updated content, manageable. Um, and so when we talk about management, we mean things like updating, publishing, unpublishing, Archiving, searching, moderating, automating of tasks, securing user privileges, all that sort of thing. Um, by providing administration interfaces, uh, it should allow people with little or no understanding of web architecture to become content publishers. Okay, so that's, that's, that's sort of the ideal of, of all of these CMSs, is that you don't need to, you don't need to employ or waste a highly technical web developer, web designer's time with just being a data entry person. You can provide interfaces that are hopefully simple and logical enough that, that someone whose job is a writer or an editor can use these and, and be the content contributors to the website. Um, okay, and these can be internal and external users, so users can, uh, so <coughs> external users of the website uh, can be leveraged as, as content contributors as well. Uh, you get things like user <coughs> accounts and privileges, so you can assign different levels of access or, or different, uh, different abilities to, to do different things with the content to different users. So um, it, let's say you have a, a website which is, which is like an online newspaper. In, in, in a newspaper you'll usually have writers um, but they, they, it's not their job to sort of publish it. It goes through a series of editors, and the editor is the person who, who ultimately says what will or will not go in the publication. So you can set that sort of thing up in a CMS where you can have people create content, but it's not publicly viewable until someone with uh, a publishing privileges actually comes along and goes, yes, we'll publish this and that, or maybe I'll modify it first and then publish it. Um, we've got uh, automation of processes. Uh, so, for example, again with publishing, if you want to uh, pre-create content, and this is an example, I, I, I do this for, my, for my, my blog which we use in the tutorials, if I, want to, uh, if I want to create the content ahead of time but I don't want it to be viewable until a certain date, then I can, I can set it to be, to be viewable in a certain date range rather than having to come back on that particular date and remember to publish everything. Uh, and then things like... Um, Things like updating of the of the the core website and the, the plugins and whatever else you have that can all be automated. Um, so again, we just don't have to invest so much time manually in 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 maintaining the website. And because there's a common architecture, okay? Because all every, everyone who has a, a WordPress installation, the core code is basically the same. Then we can that allows us to have a common architecture to write reusable plugins and themes for. Um, so if you write a plugin or a theme for your website, then you can quite easily uh, publish it and give it to anyone else with, uh, to install on their WordPress site, and it should work essentially the same. Um, 
Okay, so I've got here a list of some common uh, CMS features. Um, so things like automated templates, access controls, scalable feature sets, web standards upgrades, delegation and collaboration, <laughs> document workflow management, and content syndication. I don't really mind if we don't go into those in too much detail here, but there's some of the some of the feature words that you may see uh, associated with various different CMSs. So um, there are a lot of of content management systems. I've got a link here to a to a Wikipedia article. Let's see if I can click it. Okay, so this is a Wikipedia article which just lists some of the popular ones, and as you can see, there's stacks of them. Okay, just the PHP ones alone. Okay, it's nuts. There's heaps. Um, so, and some people might say there's too many CMSs. Okay, some people might say it's overkill, but you tend to have people uh, develop a CMS, get quite philosophical about it, and they think their CMS is the best, and then usually a team will fork off that and disagree and create a slightly different one which they think is the best. Um, so the issue with this is, well, which CMS do we choose? I mean, it's not going to be feasible to attempt to go and, and, and try and try out every single one. Um, but some of the things that you want to consider when choosing a CMS is, um, first of all, your needs, so your existing technological knowledge. So you can see there was a bunch of CMSs in that Wikipedia article that were built with technologies other than, than PHP. So obviously if we're teaching PHP, it's not going to make sense for us to get you to go and do one that's created in ASP or Perl or something else. Okay, so that does have some bearing on it, what your knowledge already is. Uh, there's the client client needs, and that usually relates to the, the feature set of the CMS. Um, but also the costs of setting it up, because some of these are free and some of them are, are commercial, cost money, um, and, and time frames uh, in terms of development. Um, but probably most importantly, what, what the website itself needs, so the, the CMS options. Um, so things like licensing, um, your development team, uh, security, um, if that's very important, and accessibility and code quality. A big one is documentation, excuse me, documentation because you have the best, most fully featured CMS in the world, but if there's no documentation for it, it's going to really hinder your ability to learn how to use it and, and develop for it, and that's going to add time to the time frame uh, of development. Um, and then, and then uh, training and support, if that's if that's important as well. Um, so I've got a link there to an interesting article on this whole issue, which might be worth a look. Um, so so we've got to ask what are the requirements from the website, from a design perspective, um, from an economic perspective, and from a technological compatibility perspective. And as I kind of mentioned before, you have to sort of think about what the what the lifespan of the website is going to be if this is going to be a solution that's still going to be viable in in six months a year or in ten years um, so the question when you're when you're when you've got a project uh, and and you're thinking about a CMS is is which CMS solution best meets all of these requirements and really really you just kind of have to do your research um, a good place to start is look at similar projects and see what see what uh, CMSs they use, um, and uh, just general recommendations. But then also where you can actually trying them out um, and seeing how they go. And you may you may you may find that uh, you may find that you you try maybe a handful, and and you start developing the same thing in a handful of CMSs, and it will pretty quickly become apparent which one's going to suit the project the best. Um, there is a link here to a, a website called opensourcecms.com which is actually quite useful because it has installations, demo installations of a whole bunch of open source CMSs uh, that you can actually, um, without having to install anything yourself, just use a guest login, go in and look at the, the administration interfaces and how it works and so forth. So that's a good way of, of quickly looking at a bunch of them without without having to um, spend the time installing them on your own server and, and getting them up and working.
Okay, so this is, uh, this is just a, a very simple graph which is only really attempting to illustrate one thing. I've taken uh, three of the most common open source uh, PHP based CMSs here and I've, I've sort of plotted them on a graph of complexity versus versatility. And the only point I'm trying to make here is that is a fairly obvious point, but as as the as the the versatility or the amount of features that a CMS uh, has, then usually the the complexity of using it and the learning curve into getting into it uh, becomes more steep. I mean that's just the same with any application. It's the difference between um, you know getting used to using something like Microsoft Paint versus getting used to using something like Photoshop. Paint's a much simpler application. It's a lot quicker to figure out its limited feature set than all of the inner workings of, 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 a, of a very big complex um, feature rich program like Photoshop. Um, so so uh, I, I guess as you can see here WordPress sort of uh, sits on the, the simpler side of functionality um, and, but therefore is, is a, a bit easier to get into. Um, has a bit more of a shallow learning curve. Um, and that's not to suggest that it's underpowered in any way. It's, 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 it's very flexible, quite powerful, um, and can do uh, a lot more things than most people give it credit for. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we're choosing it as, um, as, as the CMS for, for you to use uh, for, for your assignment in this unit. So, so why WordPress? Um, as, as I just said, it's a good platform to ease you into the world of uh, content management systems. It's relatively simple, but its functionality can be expanded greatly with a little extra work. Okay, so um, a lot of the features that it may lack from other more full-featured CMSs, you can actually add quite easily just by installing a few plugins. Uh, it's free and open source. One of the biggest reasons is that it's, it's popular. Okay, so I've got a stat here which I just looked up yesterday. Um, which estimates that WordPress is used by actually 19% of all the websites on the World Wide Web. Um, so that's a big chunk. Um, and as a content management system, it has by far the biggest market share, almost 60% question. Can we get that stat like, balanced by site traffic? Um, if, if you want to look it up, I'm sure you can. I don't have it right now. Um, but... But yes, that's a legitimate question to ask by site traffic, and I'm sure there's a lot of heavily trafficked sites that aren't using WordPress as a CMS. Um, but yeah, I don't have that information on me. Um, so the benefits of it being popular are, are sort of twofold. One is if, if it's that popular and if it's increasing in popularity, then there's a good chance it's not going to go away anytime soon. Okay, so... Um, so that's with a view to sort of the long-term management of your website. Um, it, it's, it's probably going to be unhelpful if you, if you choose a CMS that suddenly goes out of production um, after, after you've, you've implemented it. Um, and the, and uh, the other benefit of that is because it's very common, there's a good chance that it's going to have lots of people creating tutorials and, and documentation for it. And that is one thing that it does have going for it, is excellent documentation. Um, plenty of third-party tutorials. Uh, it's been around for a few years now and is being actively developed. So as I said, it's probably not going away anytime soon. Uh, and as I touched upon uh, earlier, it has a good track record of upgrading to new features without breaking old ones. So backwards compatibility is, is, is pretty good with WordPress compared to a lot of other content management systems. Um, and it runs on the very common uh, Apache MySQL PHP framework or server stack which we looked at last week. So as a little bit of history, WordPress uh, started out as, as simply a blogging tool um, and, and that's why I guess it uh, um, uh, earlier on there was a bit of a resistance to it being called a content management system because it, it didn't have a lot of the features of a more fully featured one but really anything that is a blogging tool is strictly by definition managing content um, and it has added a lot of 
flexibility and features to it uh, to its core set over the years. Um, okay, so I don't really need to go through any of that stuff. Um, this is just a slide which which sort of again talks to that point. Um, when when WordPress gets the criticism of not not being a CMS, which I don't necessarily agree with anyway, but you can a lot of the as I said the criticism usually stems from the fact that oh it doesn't have the features that this other CMS does. Most or if not all of those features can be added through the use of plugins. So you can I've got a list there which I won't go through, but you can do things that you know you wouldn't even necessarily associate with with something that's meant to be just a blogging tool. Um, so you can install e-commerce plugins which allow you to have a, a, a have a, um, a a shopping site using WordPress. There's um, there's another another um, plugin or framework that I saw recently called BuddyPress, which actually allows you to implement a, a full-on social network within WordPress. Um, so. So as the years go on, that argument that CMS, that WordPress is not a CMS just, I feel, get less and less legitimate. Uh, this is just an example of, of one plugin, um, which is a rebranding plugin for the login page. So the login page, um, at the point that, that this slide was created anyway, was not something that you could customize, but there was obviously a need for that. People wanted to do that, so a plugin was created that, that allowed you to add that functionality. And you can extend you can extend the functionality of WordPress basically in in any way that you can imagine. That that pretty much anything you can do in PHP, you can make WordPress do. Um, okay, and WordPress sites don't have to look like blogs. Okay, even though it began its life as a blogging tool, um, there's there's plenty of WordPress websites that you can look at and they don't look like what you would think a blog like a Tumblr or a, or a blogger site would look like. Um, and there's just a couple of examples here. These these are old now, um, may not even look like this anymore, but um, this is a, a movie trailer website, doesn't look like a blog. This I believe is someone's portfolio website, again, not what, would you, not what you would traditionally call a blog blog based layout. Okay, and there's some links here to um, um, other sort of articles with um, collations of various WordPress sites that don't look like blogs. Okay, but I don't think I need to really harp on that point. Um, okay, so the server requirements, which I may have mentioned last week, but it bears repeating. Um, as of WordPress version 3.2 at least, um, your hosting provider needs to have uh, PHP version 5.2.4 or greater installed, MySQL version 5.0 or greater, and Apache is the recommended um, HTTP server. We'll work on others, but that's the easiest one to get it configured. Um, so that's our classic Apache MySQL PHP server stack, and these are versions which aren't necessarily bleeding edge, so it should be, should be pretty common. Um, I did have a few questions last week about um, there's some web hosting that uses Dropbox to uh, store its files and after looking into that more um, we determined that, that that isn't actually a solution that will work uh, for installing WordPress because it, it simply serves static HTML and CSS files, it doesn't contain the database or PHP. Okay, again I had, I had a similar slide. Um, in last week's lecture about the, uh, the the LAMP server stack or variations of it, um, different diagram but the same same uh, same general concept. Um, so I, I I don't think I really need to repeat that again. Um, I've got some instructions here uh, on installing WordPress on your remote web server. Uh, this content's all duplicated uh, in the tutorial content, and we will go through this. But I'll just um, I'll just sort of mention it and go over it briefly now. Uh, so we've got, uh, there's a link there to, um, to the WordPress's own instructions on installing it. And I sort of summarized those. So you've got four main steps. First is to, uh, to download the WordPress install package, which will be a zip file. Unzip that and upload that to your web server using an FTP client. 
uh, and then you'll need to create a MySQL database. Thirdly, you'll need to edit uh, a configuration file within WordPress called wp-config.php and in there you need to put in the details that WordPress needs to know in order to access your MySQL database. And then finally you need to create an administrator account uh, in, in WordPress's own user account system and then, then you can start using WordPress. Okay, so these slides just demonstrate that in more detail. Um, again, we'll demonstrate this in, um, in the tutorials. Um, okay, so creating the database, again, we'll go through this in more detail in the tutorials, but um, this is something that you will, uh, on your remote web hosting, you'll, go, you'll, you'll probably achieve this through your, um, your control panel web-based uh, administration interface that you'll be given access to when, when you get your web hosting. Uh, which hopefully most people have sorted out by now. Um, and, and I'll be demonstrating in the tutorials how we go about doing that in, in the cPanel interface, which is uh, a common one, but the, 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 the solution will be fairly similar um, in, in, in any other uh, control panel interface that you might have anyway. I've got a link there to a specific tutorial on that, setting up the database using cPanel. Um, these are some screenshots which, again, I'll, I won't necessarily go over in detail here because we'll look at those in the tutorials. But essentially this is, uh, this is, so this is the cPanel interface, creating the database, you create a database name. You also need to create a database user, okay, so we need to have some sort of security around the database itself because we don't just want anyone accessing our database. Uh, so we create a, a user which essentially, essentially represents WordPress as a user uh, for the database. We give it a username and password. Uh, we assign that user uh, privileges to be able to do things with the database. In the case of WordPress, WordPress needs to essentially do everything. Okay, it needs to be able to, to uh, query the database for information, but it also needs to be able to create entries and delete them and modify them. So we give it all of the privileges. Um, and then when we've done that, that's everything set up um, and, and we can then tell WordPress the, those details that we've set up in order to access the database. Um, there's also phpMyAdmin, which again I did briefly mention last week. Um, this is another interface you might see for, for setting up databases if you're if your hosting doesn't have a, a sort of a wizard style interface for setting it up, you can do it through phpMyAdmin as well. If you are installing uh, WordPress on the QUT web server for any reason, then that's the interface that you will need to use for that. And I've got notes about that again on my blog, but as we've said, we don't really want you to do that for the assignment anyway, so I'm not going to pay that much attention right now. Um, this is the editing of the, the WP config file. So as I said, once we've set up all of the information uh, to do with the, the database, we've created the database, we've given it a name, we've created a database user, username and given them a password. WordPress needs to know all of those bits of information along with where your, um, where your MySQL server is actually hosted in order to be able to connect to that database. So we need to edit this file and then uh, re-upload it to the server. When, when you first get the initial installation of, of WordPress, there's a file in there called wp-config-sample.php. So what you do is you edit that, put in the relevant information, and then you save it as just wp-config.php. So you lose the, the sample part and re-upload that. And this is what it looks like. Okay, It's just a bunch of configuration information for WordPress. And the bits that I've highlighted here are the bits that we need to uh, put in for the, to, to, to tell it how to connect to our MySQL database. Okay, and once we've done that, uh, we uh, will run a little installation script and we can uh, create an administrator account for the WordPress site. So this is the account where you 
actually log in to the WordPress site um, and are able to create posts and edit, delete, install plugins, all of this sort of thing. And so that's all done in, in, in a setup interface within WordPress itself. Um, just a little bit about WordPress's interfaces once it is installed. Um, so there's essentially two sides to WordPress and any CMS really. You've got your, your front end and your back end interfaces. So the uh, front end interfaces, oh sorry, we'll start with the back end interfaces. The back end interfaces as an administrator, as a, as a, as a content publisher, uh, where you're going to spend most of your time. And this is where you actually add content, um, install themes, install plugins, configure settings. Okay, so these, if, if we just think back to the tutorial last week where we, we created that very simple dynamic website, um, the part that that was still lacking was any sort of administrative interfaces. In order to add the content, we still had to go into the database and manually add it there. So. The CMS adds to that this series of administration interfaces, which means that we can, with nice graphical interfaces, do all of that content management without having to touch the database directly. So that's why I said you don't worry about necessarily learning the, the, the SQL statements and stuff that we were writing because these interfaces will do that for you. You have a graphical interface, you hit a button, and then the code to go and handle all of the interfacing with the database is all already existing in WordPress for you. Um, okay, so as I said, this is where you do all your content management, editing posts, moderating comments, installing plugins and themes, managing user accounts, etc. Uh, it requires a login, which as you saw, you set up during the installation process. And this is where you can give different users different levels of access to this interface too. So you can create after you've created an, an administrative user, that user can create other users which may, you may just want to let them uh, create content but not publish it or have whatever other access rights um, you might want to assign to them. Um, okay, and there's the, admin, the admin interfaces are always accessible at your domain and then forward slash wp hyphen admin. Uh, and then there's just a link there to more detailed documentation about the admin interfaces. Okay, and then the other side is the uh, public or front-end interfaces. So this is, what, this is what everyone else sees when they go and visit your website. Okay, this is what happens when you just go to the, the root domain uh, of your website. Um, and so this is just the content. It's not, these aren't interfaces to, to manage the site. This is just the front-end content, what, what the public are intended to see intended to see. Um, and this ostensibly is the part that you end up, um, that ends up changing when you, when you apply a theme to it. So your theming will be to theme the, the front end interfaces. Um, okay, and just an extra point here that obviously once you've created, published the content, you'll probably want to go and check the front end interface to, to see what it looks like. So there's usually a bit of back and forth between creating content and then refreshing the front end interface, seeing what it looks like and if it doesn't look quite right, going back and making some changes. Okay, so we'll talk about WordPress themes now. Um, so WordPress can install themes to change the look and feel of the site. So this, as we, as we said before, was one of the advantages of having a common underlying framework. Um, is that we, they can have a theme framework whereby you can ex install existing themes or create, or create your own and then share it with, with other people if you want or even sell it for other people uh, to, in to install on their WordPress sites. Um, and this only works because we have sort of the separation of the, the content with the, the logic and the, and, and the styling. Um, so a, th a theme changes nothing about the content of your site. It simply changes how that content is uh, laid out and presented. Um, uh, so I haven't updated this. It says your first assignment here is to create your own WordPress theme. Both your assignments are really that. And the second part is creating it. The first part is, is uh, the, the proposal for it. Um, which uniquely services the content and purposes of your site, in this case, your own personal portfolio. 
this is a screenshot of the WordPress themes administration interface. So it shows you the theme that you currently have installed. Uh, sorry, the theme that you currently have activated and any other themes that you have installed. So you can have a bunch of themes um, sitting in your WordPress site and um, but obviously you can only activate one at a time. So there's two parts to getting a theme to work. You install it so it exists on your site and then you, you choose to activate one. And there's various information that goes along with describing uh, the theme. Um, there's a WordPress themes directory. Yeah, question? Can that be a bag? Themes? Yeah. Uh, normally if you want to, normally if you want to have a different layout per page, there would be separate templates within the one theme. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a WordPress themes directory. Um, which is the just the site on, on, on WordPress's or, or the section on WordPress's site where you can go and browse existing freely available themes. Um, and so you s simply just download these, um, upload them and, and activate them. Um, you, there's also an interface where you can do that directly through WordPress now as well. Um, but there's, uh, there's myriads of other places um, where you can get themes from. Um, free or, or commercial. Um, there's quite a large industry developed now around actually creating for sale WordPress themes and, and frameworks. Um, but that's not so much important to us because um, you're going to be making your own theme. Um, but we should discuss the advantages of and disadvantages of using a pre-made theme. So the advantages are you don't have to develop it. Okay, All it takes to in in install is um, download and install it and activate it. Um, and there's a lot of well-made free themes and you can take an existing theme and depending on the depending on the license it's released under you can modify it um, to suit your own needs. Uh, now the disadvantages are that again uh, any any generic solution is never going to perfectly suit your specific design uh, design problem or design solution. Um, so it's not, it's, it's impossible for them unless they're, you know, making a bespoke theme for you for them to know what your content and aesthetic is beforehand. Um, and depending on how much customization you do to it, it can actually end up taking you longer and costing you more than doing your own from scratch. And obviously you're not going to learn anything about theme development if you just install one. Um, Okay, so uh, advantages and disadvantages of creating your own theme from scratch. Pretty much, pretty much the disadvantages are the flip side for that. Okay, it's obviously going to take you a bit longer to create your own, um, and you have to learn how to make themes. But once you've learned how to make one, it's quite easily easy to make uh, another one and another one and another one after that. Um, now the advantages. Um, it's going to be unique. Okay, you know exactly. What, what your or your client's needs are going to be so you can tailor the perfect exact theme to, to exactly what the website and the content and the client needs. Um, it'll be completely flexible and customizable. You have complete control over your own resources. So a lot of the time if you download a theme, you may only actually be using a small portion of that, but all that code's still there being sort of loaded into memory and used. So if you just have your, your own theme, then it's, you only use the bits that you actually need. Uh, and of course, you get to learn how to make themes. Um, okay, we'll look at the anatomy of a WordPress theme. So what actually goes into making up a WordPress theme? How do all the pieces fit together? And, and hopefully, based on what we looked at last week in the tutorials, a lot of the philosophies of this will be similar to what we saw with with um, all of the things that we went through in that tutorial with, with just PHP and, and, and a database by itself. So first of all, WordPress themes are installed to a directory in the WordPress installation called wp-content and underneath that a themes subdirectory. So you can see in this picture here I've got, there's, there's three themes uh, installed uh, in WordPress here. 
um, but only one of those will be activated and we use that that administration interface for the themes as we saw earlier to actually choose which one uh, becomes activated. Uh, a WordPress theme simply consists of a collection of PHP files um, and CSS files and then associated uh, resources like imagery and JavaScript files. Okay, and, and, and so so essentially the theme itself is, is uh, you can almost view that as its own little PHP application that exists within the wider WordPress framework. And so WordPress will load up and then it loads up the theme and it's the theme code in there that that handles uh, the outputting of the content um, and, and the layout and all of that stuff. Uh, so the PHP files contain uh, very much like we saw last week in the tutorials, they contain HTML markup interspersed with PHP snippets which retrieve content from the WordPress database and output the results to plain HTML for the browser to render. Okay, so this is very similar to what we did last week. The only difference here is rather than, uh, it's, it's actually a bit simpler because rather than, um, rather than having to write our own functions to retrieve the information for the database and using raw PHP code, essentially all we're doing here is calling built-in WordPress functions uh, which, which will output a certain bit of information about the blog. Um, Okay, so we've, in this screenshot here, there's an example of some of the PHP snippets. This last one here, for example, is, uh, is calling a WordPress function called blog info, passing it a, a string parameter called name, and that will simply be replaced with the name, uh, the name of, the, of the site, which, which you can then change through an administration settings interface. Um, and because, again, as we saw last week there, uh, because it's, it's written dynamically here in, in, in PHP. If we then go and change the site later on, we don't have to come back to this file and, and modify this at all. It, it will automatically, when, when we save the name of the site in the administration interface, it'll be sent to the database, and then this function will simply go and, and pull whatever that current bit of information is out of the database for the site, site name and then insert it here uh, in this part of the template. Um, so, so these things are called, these things which out, output um, the information or the WordPress functions that output the information are called template tags. WordPress calls them template tags. Um, and so I've got a note here, I mean I, I already just said this about the template tag blog info which is um, in, in, so this is, I guess this is very similar to the previous previous slide, but again, just to reiterate here, shown in the PHP in the resulting HTML, HTML output, the highlighted lines here. Um, so this is simply designed to output, again, the name of the blog um, within a certain part of the HTML, in this case in between the title attributes of the head, uh, the title uh, elements of the head section of the HTML file. And, and again, just to iterate, I know I keep hammering this point, but it's very important that by the time it gets back to the browser, okay, all it's seeing is the resulting HTML output. Um, so needless to say that these, these template tag functions are going to save us a lot of writing our own PHP code. As I said last week, there's really not a lot of PHP code that will end up, end up having to write other than simply calling WordPress's built-in functions. So what we really need to know is what are these functions and how do we find them, very much like we needed to know what the PHP functions were and how to, how to find them last week. Um, so these WordPress's uh, functions and template tags are, are all documented on their website and I've got um, two links to them there. So there's one for template tags and one for um, function references. Uh, there's a little bit of crossover between them. Essentially these are all WordPress functions, but they have a subset of their functions which they call template tags, which they they say they call them that to differentiate them as as uh, as functions used for theme development as opposed to functions used for core WordPress development. But essentially, they're all PHP functions built into WordPress, and there's a bit of crossover um, between them. 
but you'll find all of them underneath uh, the, the template tags and, and the function references. Uh, another good way of finding out what does what is to look at other themes and see what kind of WordPress functions they're outputting and comparing the output and seeing what exactly uh, it is doing. And then obviously um, Googling it. Um, as I said, WordPress has stacks of, of great tutorials and, and simple examples of, of everything from the entire process of creating themes to using one particular function or, or template tag. Okay, so we'll look at the, the page structure of a WordPress uh, theme. So how it's, how it's separated into its various template files. Again, this is going to be similar to what we did separating out our PHP files in the tutorial last week. So WordPress page um, structure can be logically sectioned into, number of, into a number of building blocks as demonstrated by this image on the right here. And uh, each of these blocks corresponds to a separate PHP file in the theme directory. Okay, very much similar to, to what we did last week. The only thing that we need to make note of here is that uh, WordPress um, expects these files to be named a certain way. So uh, unless you name them the exact correct way, it's not going to know to find them. And they, they're pretty logically named. So for example, the header section, uh, it, it expects to be called header.php and then you've got footer.php and sidebar.php um, for those parts as well. Um, each block a file can be included and reused in multiple page templates um, using template tags like PHP, uh, like the get header template tag here. Okay, so again this is very similar to what we were doing last week when we were just simply including say the header.php file except for WordPress to do what we call a built-in WordPress function. So the get header WordPress function, uh, if you were to go and look at its, its code, what it would simply be doing would, would be probably looking for the header.php file in your theme directory and then using an include or require statement to, to include that in uh, the overall um, PHP combined code. Um, okay, and this is just sort of a, a, another, another demonstration of that. Um, so again, this goes to what we did last week. The, the, logical, the, the way that you divide up the various parts of the theme into the template files is logically based on what's a, a modular or reusable bit of the code. So the header section, if it doesn't change, it makes sense to put it in its own file. Same deal with the, um, the sidebar, the footer, and then having the content area as its own section. And then it's easy for us to combine all those into whatever combination we want. If we want a certain page that does have the sidebar, we can include that. If we don't want it to have the sidebar, we just don't include it. Okay, it gives us a lot of flexibility over the layouts without having to create the entire page layout each time. Again, this is just a demonstration of, of how um, the the constituent template files get included into the into the index PHP file. Again, very similar to what we did last week. Um, okay, this this is a pretty important um, diagram here. Just in terms of understanding um, how WordPress decides what template file to use based on what resource or what URL you're trying to access. And it's, it's going to be difficult probably to read on this screen because it's quite a detailed diagram. And there's, it's on, but it, I've linked it here on the WordPress website and they've actually updated the diagram, but it's essentially the same. But this is worth looking at. Um, if you can grasp this, then, then I think it, it, it makes the reason that you have templates called certain things uh, a lot more clear. So this is essentially a big flow diagram of how WordPress de decides which template files to load up based on what what kind of resource you're attempting to look at. So if, so it asks it asks you what page you're looking at, and it will determine that using the URL and the get parameters as we looked at last week. And there's going to be certain kinds of of pages uh, if you've typed in a, a URL that, that doesn't exist, then it's going to be an error 404 page. 
Okay, so for example, if it detects that, then it will first attempt to look for a template file called 404.php. Okay, so if you want a, an error message to show up there, you put that inside of that. Now, if you don't have that, what it's going to do is revert to the index.php file. And you'll notice that in every single case, if any of these other template files don't exist, it always reverts back to the index.php file. Okay, so that means that your simplest WordPress theme uh, can essentially just be an index.php file. If every page on your website is going to look essentially the same except for the content that's output, then you can just have an index.php file. Um, but that, that would be a, a pretty simple website. Um, so for example, you, you might have um, to go to your question before, you might have a, a bunch of different categories on your website and you might want to theme them differently. In this case, you could have a series of different category templates. And so what, what WordPress would do here then is, uh, depending on the URL, if you, click, if you entered a URL which pointed to a category of post, then it would attempt to first uh, look for um, a a uh, category template tag or a series of category template tags and there's a few different variations of these. First it would look for one which is category hyphen and then slug.php and slug is simply a, a short uh, a short descriptive word of, of, of what that category is. Okay so if, if I had a category called um, photography for example then my my category slug might just be photography and it would look for a template file first called category hyphen photography. If it didn't find that, it would then look for one which was category hyphen then an ID. So each category in WordPress will have an associated ID with it, so you could also have a template which uses that to define it. Then if it doesn't find that one, it will uh, attempt to find a uh, template file which is just called category.php. So you may just have one template file which is generically applied across any page which happens to be a category page, but you still want that different to your index page maybe. Okay, and so for that you can just use a category.php. Finally, if it doesn't find that, it will go through a series of others and then always revert back to index.php. So if there's no reason for you to have a different layout on your category page, then, then you don't have to go and create these extra templates. You could just always have it revert back to index.php, but it's just showing, it'll just be the content that changes. It'll show a particular category of posts rather than all of the posts. Okay, so it can look quite complicated, but the point is here that you just use what you need. Okay, so you use as, as much or as little of the template, template hierarchy as you want. If you only need one layout, then you only need to have that one template. And then you add other layouts as, as required by the different sections of your site. So we'll just have a quick look at some of the uh, most common template files. Uh, and as I mentioned before, okay, these are all these have to be named this way. In order for WordPress to be able to find them, they, they have to be named these things. So the header.php file usually contains the doc type, metadata, and head section of the HTML document, um, and it may contain the top navigation. Uh, you include the header and other template files to avoid duplicating the code it contains with the get header uh, template tag or function. The footer is essentially exactly the same, except it's anything that you would normally put in the footer, and you include it using the get footer template tag. Uh, the sidebar um, can contain basically whatever you want, but commonly, commonly it contains navigation, uh, a series of links, maybe a search form, and as we'll look at a little bit later, you can have widgetized plugins. Um, that can be added and removed through the administrator interface, um, which I'll discuss a little bit more in a second. Um, but again, logically enough, you include the sidebar using the get sidebar template tag. Now you'll notice that the get sidebar um, function actually takes a parameter called name because you can have multiple sidebars if you want. You might have a left and a right sidebar, um, and so you can include 
you can include uh, whichever one that you want by, by essentially assigning it a name and telling it through this parameter which sidebar you want to include. So you could include different sidebars on different pages, different templates, or multiple on the same page or any combination of those things. Okay, so this is uh, what I'm talking about when I say uh, the sidebar widgets. So widgets are essentially little bits of self-contained, um, almost little mini applications. Um, but they're designed to be able to be really easily added and removed through an in, uh, through a administration interface. So essentially you define an area of the template which can accept these widgets and then, and then uh, you install a widget as a plugin and you go to an, an administration interface which simply allows you to drag and drop certain widgets, usually to a, to a sidebar. So as you can see here, this is a, on the left here, this is what the uh, administration interface looks like where I would drag the different widgets in and you configure them here. And then the resulting output without having to go and modify anything in the template is these standalone little widgets output on the, on the, uh, on the, on the home page or wherever they happen to be. So you get things like calendars and lists of recent posts. You'll see on, on my blog I have a bunch of them, tag clouds, things like that. Um, there's a myriad, myriad of different widgets um, and I'm sure, you'll find, I'm sure you'll find one that will satisfy um, the, the social plugin um, requirement that you need for your portfolio as well, whether that's a Twitter or a LinkedIn or a Facebook or whatever else you want to add there. Uh, okay, so the content section, this is where you'll spend most of your time developing the theme. Um, um, so first of all, I guess we need to talk about what makes up the content in WordPress. So WordPress is quite, um, quite nicely simple in this respect in which everything is going to be either one of two types of content. And that's going to be a post or a page. Um, so your, your post is designed to be like a, a blog post. So in, in, one, in one template, uh, it's, it's common to have uh, a series of posts output, or at least excerpts of posts output on that page. A page, as, defi as defined as a content type in WordPress, on the other hand, is meant to be just a standalone page by itself. You click on a link to that page or enter the URL, and all you see is that page's content. Um, Okay, so the three main template files associated with displaying these are single.php, page.php, and index.php. And I'll go through those. So index.php is your default, I say here default front page, but it's really your default page for everything unless you create a more specific template for something else. Uh, it usually displays excerpts of recent posts but really it displays whatever you tell it to in the, in the template, but that's, that's what it's most commonly used for. Um, and we use uh, something called the WordPress loop to output the posts. And we'll look at that in more detail in the tutorials, but um, that will go back to how I was kind of stressing the importance of, of the concept of loops in PHP last week. This is the one place where we will be, you will have to use a loop uh, in order to um, output uh, a series of posts within, uh, within a template. Um, and it usually includes other constituent templates like the header footer and maybe the sidebar. Uh, the single.php template is what it looks to load uh, if you click on a, um, if you click on a, a, a the, the, say the title of a post, um, so let's say you have, you've got the home page, you've got a list of posts, you can click on usually uh, at the title of these posts and it will link to the full content of that single post and just display that by itself. So when you, when, when you navigate to that URL, the, the template it will attempt to load is called single.php. If that doesn't exist, it will just revert back to the index.php file. So it displays the entire contents of a single post um, and it, it may display comments also uh, if enabled. And again, it usually includes um, the other, uh, the header, header and footer template files as well. Page.php is what is used if you navigate to a content item which is which you've created as a page in the WordPress backend. 
So it displays the contents of WordPress page content item. Um, also may display comments um, and again usually includes the header and footer. Uh, the categories.php file uh, is um, so WordPress supports uh, custom taxonomies including in two ways, it includes categories and it includes tags. Um, they're similar, but categories are sort of self-contained like folders, whereas tags work sort of across categories. Um, but normally, normally, the category, normally the taxonomy that you will use first is, is categories, uh, p particularly as a, as a way of navigating the site. So for example, here, here's a screenshot of a slightly older version of Smashing Magazine website which is built on WordPress and um, and it is essentially a blog but they have a series of different sections which you can go to. So rather than just having one template where you have to trawl through and see everything, it makes sense if you're interested in a particular category to be able to click on that and just show that category of posts. So if we want if so if we want a different template for the for the categories section to our index page, then this is where we can use the categories.php file. Um, yep, okay. Um, now, the functions.php file uh, is, is sort of different. Uh, it's different in that it doesn't map to anything that you visually see. All of the other template files that we've looked at so far, they map to something, a URL that you go to and a bit of content that you see. The functions.php file um, is simply just a place to store bits of PHP code that may be referenced from other templates. Okay, so you could, if, if again we sort of refer to last week's tutorial, you could put this akin to the, the database PHP file that I had. It had a bunch of functions which connected to the database and retrieved information. I never visited that page, but I simply included it in my other template files so I could call those functions. So this is a this is a very similar thing. Uh, often you'll you'll have bits of reusable code, which we know we use as functions, that will perform some task that may be useful that's not already built into WordPress that we might need. And so for that we we uh, we create a file called functions.php. And again, it has to be called this because WordPress looks for that to automatically include it. So we don't have to, unlike last week where I was having to include or require my database PHP file into, into the other files in which I wanted to reference it from, uh, the functions, as long as you name it, this WordPress will automatically include the functions PHP file and you can just call functions contained within it from wherever you need. And often when you're setting up certain um, aspects of the WordPress site, like, um, like menus for example, or some plugins, then you'll need to add um, customization information to this file. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we've looked, we've had a brief overview at a look of, of, of some of the, the more common template files. As you saw from the diagram, there's a whole myriad of others. Um, um, you probably won't use, need to use most of them, um, but it's worthwhile looking at them and seeing what they do at least so, um, so you know if, if, if it will or won't be useful for you. Uh, so I've got a bunch of links here um, for more detail on just um, WordPress um, theme development in general. Um, and I, I've just repeated those the, the two links to the, the function reference and the template tags there, which we'll be referring to a lot when we're creating our themes. And a lot of this, as I said, we'll go through in more detail and demonstrate in the tutorials. Um, okay, you've also got um, navigation menus, is a big thing in WordPress uh, theming templates. Um, and there's various ways of doing this, but again, um, Essentially, this all boils down to calling a particular WordPress function in the appropriate place where you want to output the menu. Um, now, there's been different ways of doing the menus in WordPress over the various different versions. This information is actually a little bit old now. It used to be that you could really only output um, easily a list of pages or a list of categories, and that's what you got. Um, now, there's uh, there's there's sort of more flexible ways of, of um, 
of creating a menu where you can actually choose specifically what categories and pages to put on a menu through an administration interface um, and, then, and then there's other functions to output that within the template but we'll again we'll look at that in more detail in the uh, in the tutorials <coughs> um, so what about the CSS we haven't really talked about this yet uh, and the good news here is it's it's pretty much the least different part about developing the website um, so um, the one thing that you do need again is to know that there's a naming convention um, so WordPress expects that your main style sheet will be called style.css um, um, and but you can have other other style sheets that you also include or you include in the main style sheet um, using import statements or whatever um, okay but but the, the the point here is that again to harp on this point over and over again the end result of all of the PHP WordPress output that your browser sees is going to be HTML okay so the way that you implement the CSS is going to be no different all you have to do is know that know what the output HTML is going to be um, you're still going to be outputting CSS classes and IDs and HTML tags so the way that you target them with your CMS, uh, CSS is going to be uh, no different um, the only reason it's going to be slightly more difficult to develop is because um, you can't because as we've seen you can't necessarily load up um, the PHP locally it has to run on the web server and so there's a, there's, there's a little bit of a logical disconnect between um, what the ultimate HTML output will be just from looking at the PHP code but this is where tools like Firebug or whatever equivalent um, developer tools um, code inspection tools in the browsers that you have come in really handy because um, they allow you to inspect that generated um, HTML um, and, and see what CSS is applied and allow you to tinker with it there and then go back and apply that to your original code. Um, this is also one of the big reasons why why over the, the web design units here we've avoided using any kind of um, visual um, WYSIWYG editors like um, like the visual interface of Dreamweaver because uh, if you if you got used to applying your styles that way using static um, HTML and CSS files um, as soon as you start adding PHP into that it's not going to work because it's not going to be able to process the PHP and load it up and, and allow you to see those changes instantly um, Okay, uh, so we'll talk um, a little bit about installing the theme. It's pretty simple, but um, again, there's some conventions to follow. So WordPress looks uh, for some predefined text in a comment block at the top of your style.css file so it can display this information about the theme in the administrator interface. So this is a, a, an example of the, the CSS comment information at the top of one of the built-in themes. And it's essentially just a some predefined uh, sort of text headings with some information. So th uh, things like the name, the the URL where you can find the theme, a description of it, version, author, and and tags. Uh, it will also look for a file called screenshot.png in the template directory to provide a preview thumbnail of the theme. So one of the last things you should do once you've developed your theme is take a screenshot of what it looks like. Uh, and then put that in the theme folder so that if you or anyone else is installing the theme they that will show up in in the theme administration interface okay so that's and that's what it looks like in the theme administration interface so the part on the right here is the description okay that's all pulled from that top comment section in the style.css file and then the thumbnail there is the screenshot.png file that you include um, and so installing the theme then is simply a matter of putting the theme folder in the wp content slash themes directory and then going to the themes administration interface and, and activating it. Okay, so uh, in summary, um, WordPress theme development is essentially all of your static um, web design philosophies, principles that you already know, plus the added power that we've already started to explore of, of PHP in the dynamic web.